your three leaves I'd long to free when there's brighter days in Ireland I'll come home and marry thee Since the 17th century, England has had control over most of Ireland. In 1801, the Act of Union officially brought Ireland into the United Kingdom. This event would fuel centuries of conflict. In 1920, Ireland had been partitioned into the Irish Republic in Northern Ireland, which was in the United Kingdom. Protestants in Northern Ireland largely defined themselves as British, and support remaining in the UK, they're Unionists. Catholics define themselves as Irish, many desiring a united Ireland, they are nationalists. A civil rights movement would lead to British troops being deployed in Northern Ireland. There was a period of internment when British soldiers could arrest anyone without trial. Paramilitaries, which were unofficial forces, remained active in Northern Ireland. The conflict's apex was Bloody Sunday, when the police shot and killed 13 people during a march in 1972. The conflict in Northern Ireland, known as the Troubles, started in the 1960s and was one of violence and political and social polarization, fueled by nationalists who wanted sovereignty and by unionists who opposed this. The intensity of the conflict has made compromise difficult, and Northern Ireland is still searching for peace. Irish struggles for sovereignty, troubled conflict and ambitious compromise. In 1968, building off the international civil rights momentum of the year, a civil rights movement was born in Northern Ireland. Catholics were indisputably oppressed in Northern Ireland by the wealthier, more powerful Protestants. Catholics and Protestants lived in separate communities, with Catholics having a harder time getting houses and jobs, and often unable to vote due to their inability to afford to pay taxes. Professor Rafferty was 13 when the troubles broke out. Right, did you have any uh, personal experience with the discrimination yourself? Well, I mean, o only in the sense that um, going to the Catholic school, as one did, uh, we were told, and this is even as primary school kids, that because we were Catholics, we simply would not get jobs. The idea that the state was against Catholics was you know, very prevalent um, uh, as part of, of Catholic ethos. Catholics called for one man, one vote, to give all people the vote, not only simply taxpayers. Because Catholics were more poor than Protestants and less likely to have jobs, they were less likely to be able to pay taxes or vote. There was, unsurprisingly, pushback from Protestants. Some believe that the civil rights movement was a ploy from Republican nationalists to unify Ireland into North and South again. The civil rights movement was a, a movement that actually was a United Ireland movement. The civil rights movement was tied up with threats and was tied up with other things. The separation between Catholics and Protestants grew during 1968 to 1972. It was an incredibly tense time, especially as nationalists and unionist paramilitary groups inflicted violence, and there were large marches by Catholics, in which there was constant tension between the marchers and the police. In 1968, the Derry March, protesting housing and employment discrimination of Catholics, was held despite being banned by police, and the police Royal Ulster Constabulary charged the crowd. Catholics and Protestants became further divided by this. A 1969 Cameron report said that police were violent toward the protesters. Unnecessary and ill-controlled force was used in the dispersal of the demonstrators. Protestants called it untrue, guilty of lying and praising the Irish Republican Army. I want to uh, make it perfectly clear that the Cameron Commission is guilty of deliberate lying. It has been reported widely in the press as a eulogizing of the Irish Republican Army. Catholics wanted civil rights. Protestants said the Catholics had underlying radicalism. They disagreed about the facts of what was happening in Northern Ireland. The situation was not getting better. In 1969, believing the Northern Irish government could not control the chaos, the British government deployed troops in the area. Compromise is unfathomable, but the British troops would keep peace. At first, the British forces were welcomed by the Catholics. elements associated with the IRA start shooting at the, at the soldiers to try and provoke shooting back, right? And, and, and to, to, to separate out people they saw as their, uh, their population from the, from the British Army. This then leads to internment. 
When internment began, violence spread in Northern Ireland. From 1971 to 1975, British police could arrest anyone, without trial, if they suspected them of being members of illegal paramilitary groups. This certainly was not a good idea, though the Northern Irish government at the time asserted that this would bring peace. I ask those who will quite sincerely consider the use of internment powers as evil to answer honestly this question. Is it more of an evil than to allow the perpetrators of these outrages to remain at liberty? Many innocent Catholics and Protestants were being arrested, taken away from their families. People became more radical and, in anger, joined paramilitary groups. A serving British Marine officer expressed how unsuccessful it was. He writes that internment has increased terrorist activity, perhaps boosted IRA recruitment, polarized further the Catholic and Protestant communities, and reduced the ranks of the much-needed Catholic moderates. In a worsening situation, it is difficult to imagine a solution. Internment caused anger in the Catholic community. One of the most violent moments of the Troubles was Bloody Sunday. At a march on January 30th, 1972, between 10 to 20,000 individuals protested internment. During the march, 13 men were shot dead by police. Recent research has found that the British police fired on the protesters first. This wasn't an act of self-defense by the police. At the time, British police will say that they were being shot at from the crowd. Uh, we came under fire from the bottom of the flats, from the flats. We were also petrol bombed, and uh, some acid, in fact, was poured on us from the top of the flats. But Catholics will say that the crowd did not instigate it. Nothing for them, sir. I'm absolutely no, certain of that. I can speak of this uh, without any difficulty whatsoever because I was there. I was just standing at the flats when the Saracens moved in, first of all, and there was nothing fired at them, positively nothing fired at them whatsoever. There weren't even stones fired. People ran in all directions in the open fire. Two years after Bloody Sunday in 1974, there was an attempt to create a power-sharing government. This was the Sunningdale Agreement. British government asserted direct rule of Northern Ireland, and the Northern Ireland Secretary tried to work with the Nationalist Social Democratic and Labour Party and the Ulster Unionist Party, having them share power. It was unsuccessful. Compromise would be difficult. Meanwhile, there was ongoing violence. As violence increased, there was a shift, and paramilitary groups of both loyalists and nationalists were treated like criminals, not political prisoners. The 1980s began with protests. There were a couple of hunger strikes very famously in 1980 and 1981. And in the 1981 hunger strike, 10 men starved themselves to death. By the early 90s, more than 3,000 people had been killed. More than 10,000 people injured. Politicians and the people of Northern Ireland needed peace. After nearly 20 years of policy building, violence, and reworking, a Good Friday Agreement was reached in 1998. There would be a devolved government, with power transferred from London to Belfast in Northern Ireland. There'd be a Northern Ireland Assembly, an executive committee, and unionists and nationalists would share powers. The Congressional Research Service notes that the 1998 agreement included provisions on decommissioning, disarmament of paramilitary weapons, policing, human rights, UK security normalization, and the status of prisoners. Further agreements were made between the Democratic Unionist Party and Sinn Féin, the political party of the IRA. However, even today, the relations between unionist and nationalist parties are fragile. Brexit may also greatly affect Northern Ireland. There have been renewed questions about the Northern Ireland's status within the UK. The conflict in Northern Ireland is nearly a century old, starting at the partitioning of Ireland in 1920, but the struggle for compromise began fairly recently, and is unfinished to this day. There are certainly political implications of the conflict, but the effect of political violence on children and families cannot go unnoted. We did a six-wave longitudinal study in Belfast. We found that uh, exposure to uh, political violence in the community, uh, internalizing problems like uh, anxiety and depression, and externalizing problems like uh, aggression and hostility. Um, how do you think... Catholics and Protestants will ever be able to compromise or have peace without that shared experience. I, I do think it's, you know, there's there's still a great deal of separation, but uh, there's, there's a genuine sense that they are stronger ultimately together than they are apart. The extent and intensity of the Northern Irish conflict has made compromise difficult. But if the Northern Irish conflict can teach us anything, it is that perhaps compromise and unity is our most powerful tool for the future. In the dark, a ship was anchored On a bright St. Patrick's Day 
on the key.